I'm Jane Jones, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my painting practice and one of the techniques that I use. Color is probably the most important element in my work. And as we see color, it is light interacting with a surface. And that's energy, because we're looking at light. But artists work with physical pigments, which have much different qualities than energy. For a realist artist, one of the most important considerations is how to represent the real world in two dimensions with physical pigments. The solutions are many, and one of the most important tools that I use is the technique of underpainting and glazing, and that for me mimics the colors of flowers in sunlight the very best way that I can. Here you're looking at the photo of the underpainting for this picture. I started using the technique of underpainting and glazing many years ago, figuring it out as I went. Through the paintings I had created up until then, I had learned that no matter how opaque an oil color is, it is not completely opaque and will be influenced by what is underneath it. Usually I learned this as a painful lesson of what not to do. Underpainting and glazing is an oil painting technique using multiple layers of paint, so it requires time, time between the, uh, for the layers of paint to dry, and a lot of patience. The way that I use this technique is with colored underpaintings. The more traditional way of creating underpaintings is by mixing a dark, dull color with white. But I choose to use colored underpaintings because I think it allows for fresher color, which works really well for the sometimes light and rather delicate colors of flowers. The same here is true of these, this fruit in the sunlight. Each color is painted a lot lighter than I ultimately want it to be. Look at how pasty and sort of anemic these colors are. That's because they have a lot of white in them. It's like trying to go from Denver to Omaha via Oklahoma City. So you kind of go in the wrong direction and then course correct and get back to where you want to be. So each color is painted a lot lighter than you want it to be. And then when that layer is dry, transparent layers of color are painted on top of it. Some areas will require one very light glaze, usually in the light areas like here and, and maybe here, that might be one layer of glaze. And then other more intense or darker areas might require up to 12 layers of color or more. None of these are dark enough to require that, but I've done paintings that required actually more than 12 layers of glaze and the colors get just rich and deep and dark. They're beautiful, but it does take a lot of time. When we look at opaque colors, the light reflects off of the color. This is just opaque paint here. So the light is just reflecting off of this and you're seeing light that's reflected off of this color. With underpainting and glazing, the light passes through the transparent layers of glaze, reflects off the white in the underpainting, and then comes back through those transparent layers of glaze. So you see light that has passed through color rather than reflecting off of it. Sort of like the difference between a stop sign and a stop light. As you can see here, the colors are more alive, and if you were to see it in person, you would see that the objects here have a very luminous quality, like stained glass. When making a painting or any piece of art, often the first question can be, what objects to paint? But really, the first question should be, what do I want to express with this painting? For me, every painting expresses my love of nature, which is why I use natural objects, mostly flowers. So those are the objects, but the subject goes way beyond that. So next I'm going to show you a painting that I'm working on and how I'm using um, various techniques and, and colors to create the communication that I want in that painting. Okay, before I get into what I have to say here, I wanna say, that if you hear some strange noise in the background, I have four dogs, two cats, and of course they want to be right here with me. So I apologize for them in advance. This is the photo that I'm working from to create a painting that I'm making to honor and remember our wonderful Pomeranian Petey, who died last spring. He was always joyful and happy, affectionate, and loved to play games, for which we sometimes understood the rules. And the little stinker also loved to eat my tulips. Tulips that were designated for compositions to be photographed for paintings. So the tulips were really important to me. But he loved to pull them up, blossom, and whatever else came with it, and eat the flowers. 
So a painting to honor him had to be tulips, not only because he loved them, but also because they are very happy flowers and we grow a lot of them in bright and joyful colors. So this is the composition that I started with. It's not necessarily the one that you're going to see in my painting, but this is what I started with. Okay, now I had not photographed this original image with this idea in mind to make this a tribute painting for Petey. And I wanted to have tissue paper in it. And I didn't photograph this original painting with the tissue paper. So I wanted the tissue paper protecting the vase. So I had to re-photograph the vase in drapery with tissue paper and meld the two images together. So here is the tissue paper. It's not in the same scale, but you get the idea, okay? Now, so I re-photographed the same vase in the same orientation. I've made that mistake before, and with the tissue paper, and then I used the drapery from the shoot with the, the tissue paper. And so then I melded it together with what I already had, and I do this while I'm making a detailed drawing for the painting. We call it Jane Chop because I'm much better at drawing than Photoshop. And I wanted the tissue paper as a symbol of protection because it was our privilege to care and protect, care for and protect the little guy. So it's protection and a hug. And it has the polka dots because, well, polka dots are just fun and Petey was just nothing but fun. Now, I want you to look at um, how bright and intense um, these colors are, okay? Um, I didn't use this flower or this one. I substituted one for this. You'll see it when I show you the underpainting. And I substituted a, a much better orientation of this flower um, for what's in here. So I made those changes and added the tissue paper, but I want you to notice how bright and lush these colors are, okay? So I'm going to take this away. And you can see how chalky these colors are. They're very pastel and chalky and kind of dead uh, compared to those in the working photo. Um, <clears throat> so here, the objects express a lot of what I want to communicate. Um, the next question for me is how to use technique to communicate the, the joyfulness of Petey in this. So I always begin with a toning layer of transparent color that will influence the colors on top of it. So this was the toning layer, okay? The background and the drapery are painted on top of it. Um, you probably can't see it, but there are little bits of the pink that show through here, and you can certainly see some of the pink showing through down here in the drapery. And I do that to help unify and harmonize the whole thing. So there's a, a layer of pink under all of it that's influencing this color and this color. And of course, it's a color that I pulled from some of the flowers here. So I begin with a layer of transparent color, and so, <clears throat> but, and I put a lot of liquid in it, okay? I use the liquid in it to get it to smooth out, but also because the liquid in the toning layer will help subsequent layers to dry more quickly. Now, at Windsor Newton, they say this doesn't happen, but I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I can tell you, it does happen. This made this and this dry much more quickly than they would have otherwise. So... Usually I use an opaque background because it contrasts really well with the luminosity of the glazed flowers and heightens that effect of luminosity. Opposites, one when you use opposites, one enhances the other and then the other enhances the first one. So these are all really matte, they're very opaque just like the background so they have much the same quality as this. However, after this was dry, I put a white layer underneath the outline of each one of these flowers, I call it an undercoat, so that the color of the background would not influence the lovely and rather delicate tulip colors. So there's a white shape underneath each tulip, and then this is the underpainting that I did on top of each one. Um, this using a, a, an opaque background and luminous flowers is also an accommodation to working with pigments to create the illusion of light and energy. One of the last things that I will do to this painting is crumble a layer of warm white over the lightest areas in the drapery. So you can see how white they are here, 
but they will be whiter with a warm white when I put another layer or two of white on top of them. Um, creating layers of white to help intensify in the light areas so they look more like reality works really well. The more layers, the lighter it gets. The whites of the tissue paper, you can see it's sort of this shape here, the whites of the tissue paper won't be as, as light as the white fabric um, and will have polka dots, which are fun, just like Petey was. Um, the whites will be light in color, so in the background, to create harmony with it and the drapery. The color of the dots will echo the colors of the flowers, but won't be glazed, so they won't compete with the flowers. They'll be secondary. So, let me show you a little bit about glazing. Okay, I've got my table here with paint set up. Now, I use always use transparent colors when I'm glazing because they make the most beautiful glazes. You can glaze with opaque colors, um, but they don't give the, the transparency and that sort of jewel stained glass effect that transparent colors do. So I'm going to do some glazing on this petal right here. All right, and so I'm going to start with the pink. And when I'm glazing, I use liquid. Okay, I use liquid, um, the regular liquid, not the fine detail or the gel formula, just plain liquid. I like the viscosity of it, and I've been using it for a really long time, so I know exactly how it works. So here's my palette. These are my tube colors up here. Um, transparent yellow, perling red, permanent carmine. I use that instead of um, alizarin because it's more permanent. This is uh, Michael Harding, Quinacridone Magenta. I love that color. Ultramarine Blue. This is a violet that's a mixture of uh, this, the Permanent Carmine, and the Ultramarine Blue to make the violet. And then I have Viridian down here. So um, I'm going to start with the pink area up in here. Yeah, I'm going to start with the pink here. So I'm going to just dress my brush in liquid. I don't want it to be too juicy, so I'm going to dress it in that. And then I'm going to come over here to, um, I think, the permanent carmine. But I want this to be really light. So the way that glazing works is the more liquid you have in the brush and the less pigment, then the lighter the color is. So you can see right there that I've got a very faint kind of a pink, and that's exactly what I want. This would just be way too much for that area. So I've got a nice light pink on my brush, and you don't want the brush to be juicy. So if you can make it sort of a print with it, then it's too juicy, and it's just going to slip and slide around and be a nightmare to work with. It'd be sort of like working with cooking oil. Okay, so I'm going to start here in the lightest area, just to make sure that my color's right, and it is. I'm just going to paint this on exactly like I did the underpainting. And when I do the underpainting, I make the paint very, very flat. I use a lot of mop brushes to create a very glass-like smooth finish because any texture that's in this is going to be picked up by the glaze and enhanced by it. And I don't, if there's surface texture on a painting, then it is going to have then people will look at the surface rather than through it. And I want my paintings to be a window that you're looking through into this other reality that I've created. And the underpainting is controlling what this color looks like. Like over here where it's a little bit darker, that's going to control this color. So it'll be a little darker where it's supposed to be. I put as much information into the underpainting as I possibly can. Um, that way I know it's there, I don't have to worry about it. And then I see the glazing part as the fun part. It's like, I've already baked the whole cake, made it level, done whatever you have to do to make that work. And then I get to have the fun. So to me, this is the most fun part. The rest of it is pretty much work. 
Okay, so I've got that in, I've got this in. I don't want to lose the white along this edge right here. And then there's a little bit of shadow there, so I'm going to pick up, um, I think this is magenta with some violet in it. Yeah, that's what it is. You might see my little marks here. Um, I marked down what the mixtures are because I think I'm going to remember, but I've been down that road too many times, and when I come back and glaze this again, I may not remember that. Okay, so I'm not exactly in the lines there, so I can take a kneaded eraser and just erase here where I painted outside of the lines. This is one of my favorite painting tools, is a kneaded eraser. It picks up this paint so well, and I got a little too much paint there. I can press it with my finger and get some off. Yeah, actually, I got just the right amount off. Okay, now I need to grab a mop brush, a soft brush, and work on just smoothing this out. And color it outside of the lines there, too. And so I'm going to take this rather stiff mop brush, it's made out of soft white goat hair, and just scumble this, just rub over this to smooth it out. And to get some of it moving across the white here to influence that white so that it's like white on pink. I don't want it to look like just a white stripe going down through there. Need a little bit more glaze. Down in here. And I used just a little bit of liquid to clean that color out of my brush. Okay. So now I'm just going to go over this and smooth it out. See how much more alive that color is? See how much more alive that pink is? Now, this is a really light area, so I'm probably only going to glaze over this once. And it looks like I need to just bring the glaze just kind of over the white and then scrub it out a little bit. Okay, I don't want to eliminate it, but I definitely want it to have a pink influence. Like it's not just, as I mentioned, a white stripe. So I'm going to take my brush here and try to scrub some of that out. And this brush is stiff enough that I can do that. See how much softer that is. Now if I want, if I decide Later that I want to go back and restate that white, I can paint with opaque white on top of this. I'll just have, I'll be painting dry paint on top of dry, dry painting. And so I'll have to kind of tickle the edges of that white out if I want to do that. Or I can look at it now and say, is that light enough? And eh, no, I don't think it is. So I'm just going to take my paper towel. a little bit more of that out. That looks good. So for me, I lay down glaze, I pick up glaze, um, I use paper towels, very soft ones, because the underpainting layer is very thin. It's real easy to rub through it. So I use really soft paper towels like Viva. If you use something like, I don't know, our other paper towels are the Costco brand. And those are really coarse. You could use those things for sandpaper. And if you use one of those on top of this delicate underpainting, uh, you're going to be redoing the underpainting because it will scratch through it. Okay, there's that. Now I want to get some of the yellow in there. And I'm going to make sure to sit, put my paintbrushes to the side because I don't want to add pink to the yellow area. All right, so I've got, for that area, I've got transparent yellow mixed with my violet, 
and I mixed it to be a little bit green because I mixed this to be a little bit golden and really yellow in sunlight. Um, the shadows have the blue sky reflected into them, so they're a little bit of a green yellow. Um, so that's that's what this is for. It's kind of a pukey looking green actually. And then this is the transparent yellow and it's just a little too bright um, for this delicate yellow here. And so I um, mixed it down with, uh, dulled it a little bit with some of the violet. So you can see, I mean, it's interesting with these transparent colors. What you see in the mass tone here is a really dark color. Oftentimes you can't even see what color it is. Like here, you can't tell what color that is. You really can't tell what color this is by this ugly blob here, by this uh, mass tone. But the undertone, that's what we need to be interested in, is how does it pull out? How's it going to paint? Okay, I'm going to hope that this paints just fine. So I've got my brush, and I'm going to, again, um, dress it in some liquid and pull some of this out. Keeping it really light. Because this is a really delicate yellow. Okay. So now I'm going to come in here. over that, that very light area with a lot of liquid in between. And then I'm going to come back here and just soften this edge with the pink a little bit. Something over here. And then for the shadow area, then I'm going to pick up my sort of greener yellow. This is not a color that I love. But I made it a little more green with a little more blue in it than I want it to be um, because I want to have it neutralize this once a little bit. So I'm going to come in here and paint into the lightest area just to make sure the color is right. work out just fine. When I'm trying to figure out what color I want these glazes to be, because on the palette I've got the mass tone and the undertone, and but I need to check it really closely with sometimes the working photo or to make sure it's in the, you know, going to work with what the underpainting is. And so I just have some cut up pieces of white palette paper um, in sort of half, you know, maybe two by half inch sections. And I paint the glaze on that. And then hold it up to the working photo or my monitor or the painting that I'm working on. Okay, that needs to be smoothed out and I made sure to pick up a brush that does not have pink in it. I have my brushes laying on paper towels and when I'm doing a a two color thing like this. I keep the brushes for one color on one paper towel and the brushes for the other on the other paper towel and, and hopefully they're still in that arrangement by the end of the painting session. Okay, so I've got that darkened. Alright, so you can see that coming to life a little bit. If I need to, I'll restate this, this a little bit um, later if, if I decide that it needs it. It's not very prominent in the photo. So now I'm going to come over here and do some glazing in these areas. So I need to set aside my yellow brushes. Come back over here to my pink ones. So I'm not exactly sure which one of these pinks I want to use. Um, I'm pretty sure that what I want to do is This area is more in the light than this area, and so I want it to be a little bit warmer. So I'm going to use some 
permanent carmine because it is, oh, wait a minute, that is not it. Okay. Oh, I can help my brush picking up a little more liquid and I'm going to come over here. Yeah, that is permanent carmine. And this color is a bit more intense than this very light petal out here. So I'm going to have more pigment on my brush, not so light. Um, and I don't necessarily want to get these darker glazes in one layer um, to uh, two layers works just fine. And that way you can put the second one in the areas where you want the, the darker, brighter, more intense color. And leave parts of it with just one layer or however many layers. Look how beautiful that color is. Isn't that just exquisite? Ah, I love these colors so much. Okay, now this rolls back a little bit so it's more of a violet. And this part of the shadow right here, there's light passing through this, this light colored petal right here. So it's, the shadow is actually lighter here and darker along the edge. So along that edge, I'm going to use a pink that has a bit of violet in it. Well, you might catch this edge right here. And then come in and smooth this out and smooth it into this so that those two areas appear to be parts of one thing. And then smooth this out. Isn't that color just beautiful? Now, I think probably the most beautiful part of this petal is actually in here. So I'm going to take this violet color and I'm going to darken along here. Oh, I could use more pigment. Okay, and darken along this edge, the shadow. And notice that in this area, I painted it pretty light. It's got a lot of white in it. And the reason for that is in the photo, the light that passes through here transmits some of this pink into that shadow and it's just a beautiful red color. And I wanted to be sure for that to show up so I'm going to smooth this out a bit, soften it along this edge. So I don't want a totally hard edge right there, All right? because the shadow is part of this petal. And then I mixed a color that I really like. It's very red. Might be a little too warm, might be a little too red, but then I can dull that down with a, a little bit duller color and the, the fire of this color will still show through. That's one of the fun things about doing layers is every layer is influenced by what's underneath it. So if I put a really beautiful red color in here, okay, now that's much brighter than what that shadow area actually looks like. But I can get that color in and the, the brightness and sort of the, the fire of it and then probably go over it with this color, or maybe just the, the color that I used here, and dull it down a little bit, but the fire of it will still come through and be really, really beautiful. So, sometimes even in the underpainting, I paint the wrong color, again, sort of like getting to Omaha via Oklahoma City, maybe even Houston. I'm going to soften and blend that together. Or a bigger mop brush. C 
see how beautiful that color is? And when all of these flowers are glazed, they're just going to look like a party, which is exactly what I want because P was a party dog. Party wrapped up in a dog costume. Okay, so there you've had a bit of a glazing demonstration. I think I could keep painting on this area all day because I just love that color so much. I just love looking at it. But sometimes I have to remind myself that uh, looking at the color is not the job. The job is to make the painting and spending the day gazing at the underpainting isn't, or the glaze layer isn't going to get me where I want to go. But anyway, now if I can't lift this with my kneaded eraser, then I will come in. Oh, no, it looks like that actually is red. Oh, yeah, it's red uh, moving down into some shadow. So pick up a little darker color here. And then I'll darken that again in the next layer. So, so I'll bring this in, and then I'll go in and paint the yellow areas just like I painted these over here. You may have noticed that while I was painting this, I had the hand in this a little bit. That is something that I work every day to avoid, is putting my hand in wet paint. Um, but I usually work with this flat on a um, drafting table rather than upright. And I work, however I'm going to work in a day, I always work from upper left to lower right to keep my hand out of the paint. So there you go with how to get some glazing done. More and more layers will make some of these really beautiful, like this red violet tulip up here. Um, is just a really deep, rich red violet. Um, and it'll be just beautiful with, uh, it'll take three or four layers of glaze to, to get those colors. Um, so there you go with some information about glazing. And I use glazing um, because I want the flowers to be luminous and beautiful and look like jewels. And that's, so this the technique is how I make make the best representation of flowers in the sunlight. So I encourage you to consider what you want to express with each painting that you're making and then assess what composition and, and techniques will help you to create that communication. And now here is my finished painting with all the glazing and details. You can see how glorious the colors are with transparent glazes and how the tissue paper adds to the joy of this image as well as adding protection to the breakable glass and flowers. I teach this painting technique, color mixing and use, and composition at the Art Students League in Denver, as well as on the DVDs that are available on my website.